All right, thank you. Well, let me start over. Thank you all for being here. It's a little after 2 o'clock. Uh, we, we may have a few more people joining us as we move forward, but uh, we want to go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing I'd like to do today is invite uh, the committee members and all of the people in the audience uh, to the Alamo Regional Rural Planning Organization's workshop. That's a workshop that is, uh, helps TxDOT develop its uh, rural transportation improvement plan, their RTIP. And uh, that, their, uh, that plan covers uh, the same counties that are covered in, in the Alamo Area Council of Government's uh, jurisdiction. I think it's eight or, eight or 12 counties. But that meeting will be held <clears throat> uh, next Tuesday uh, from 4 to 6 at Gaddis United Methodist Church in Comfort. Uh, and that's at highway, on Highway 87 just south of the uh, Comfort High School. Uh, they also will have a virtual uh, opportunity, uh, a virtual option that you can log on after the meeting up until April the 7th and make your comments uh, known about uh, how you feel about their transportation improvement plan, whether it needs to go forward as it currently configured, whether projects need to come off or projects need to be added. So, uh, Let's see, uh, Jeff, Carol, I think you've got an announcement. Sure. Um, so we've talked about it in previous meetings that the city is working on our mobility plan. Um, so we actually are having an open house this Thursday evening. Um, it's actually from 3 to 7 p.m. at the Kronkowski place. And so it's kind of a come and go type scenario where you can come and talk. So uh, you can be there as little or as long as you would like to. Um, it'll be an open house deal. We'll have uh, quite a bit of presentation boards. Um, but really, we're looking for a lot of public feedback um, from citizens, city, county, everywhere um, on transportation mobility comments. And it's not just vehicles. We're really looking for pedestrian and bike comments as well. Um, and that's for our, our mobility plan. And so this will be the first of two um, public meetings. We're planning on having another public meeting later at the end of May. Um, early June there. That's it. What is the outcome or what's the, the, the product of that plan, sure. uh, Jeff? Um, sure. So the, the city mobility <clears throat> plan is going to be looking at a handful of things, um, really kind of building upon a lot of the stuff we've talked about here the last couple of years. But one of the big things we're going to look at is right now today the city has 22 different road sections in our code ordinance. Um, so that's a little excessive. We're going to try to simplify that. Um, we're going to try to take some of the concepts that we've talked about in some of these meetings and kind of come up with maybe some road sections that are could fit in different areas of town differently and more better. Um, so we're going to look at the thoroughfare plan itself. So as everyone knows, the 2019 is the thoroughfare plan that the city of Bernie is the current one. Um, it's been updated many times all the way back to 1974, but the 2019 is the current one. So we're going to look at making some tweaks and changes to that. Um, and then also coming up with uh, just a prior prioritization kind of matrix so that we can look at roadway projects or mobility projects here in the city of Bernie for what city of Bernie might want to do to do some projects here in town for actual construction dollars. Um, and that's it. And the other part there I wanted to kind of mention as well is we do have a, uh, a small advisory committee on the, for the city deal. And uh, it's, it's made up of, we have one city councilman, Bryce, who's not here today, but he's on this committee. Um, we have one P&Z member who's uh, Tim, which coincidentally, he's not here today either. Um, I don't know where all my people are. Uh, we have one school person um, representing the ISD, which is Rich, who's on this committee as well. We have one city at large person, which is Jonah, and we have one county at person at large, which is Ben. Um, so we've purposely picked a committee of entirely people that are on this committee um, just to make sure um, we're not losing any knowledge um, in between there. So I wanted to point that out as well. Very good. Uh, Bob, you want to say anything about your, uh, your role on uh, the Mayor's Minute? Uh, Apparently my wife showed me, uh, apparently it went live today. You've seen it the other day. I, yeah. I saw a bit of it. I haven't seen the whole thing yet. But it was, uh, it was, it was, it was a, an, an attempt by the city to address 
for the public what we're doing here and how that would mesh with the work to come. And uh, he, they have a media person on staff here who's pretty remarkable about being able to take random clips and sentences that people say and go edit them and make it coherent. And uh, he did a good job of making Tim and I look like we knew what we were talking about a little bit. So it's, it's worth a quick watch. And, and so the city, the open house is this Thursday from 3 to 7. There is, if you go to the City of Bernie website, down at the bottom, there's a link to the mobility study. And we have some similar feedback requests um, to what this committee's done. But there's a website that you can go visit and draw lines and put dots on, um, similar to what we did with AMPO. Um, so that's open and online. We've already received quite a bit of feedback already. Um, and then there's also uh, some other little things that you can do on there as well. But go check out the website if you... And on the paper that was at the front door, there's a... Uh, you can use your phones now, but you can scan this QR code and it'll bring you to the website. Uh, so you can input that in. Very good. <clears throat> Other opening comments? Gary? It, it's a yeah, station to station kind of open house, correct? So come and go whenever time you'd like. Anything else, Gary? Rankin, open the comments. Bobby? Negative. Jonah? Were you all going to mention anything about voting? Uh, have, encouraging people to vote? <laughs> if you haven't voted and you're here, you really shouldn't leave without voting. You can vote right in, down the hall over there. And it's the last day. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the article that you wrote in the Hill Country Weekly that I thought represented the difficulties that we're going to talk about today. Um, I really appreciated that. You're welcome. Yeah? No, nothing. Thanks. Steve? Northern? I'll treat you. Scribe? All right, one, one last thing oh. announcement uh, yesterday at the Commissioner's Court. Uh, we did approve the uh, purchases purchase of uh, streetlight data for a hundred uh, station or hundred zone um, subscription, and so at some point we need to soon come back to this committee and say the, that that'll get us about ten intersections, and I think we probably ought to gather a, a small committee uh, subcommittee to say okay, which intersections do we want to analyze? We have I know the city has some recent traffic count data, but we may want to look at origin, destination, truck composition at different parts of, of the community. Uh, so if you're interested in that, let me know. We should probably be going live on that in, I would guess, a couple of weeks or something like that, maybe sooner. Okay, well, let's just go ahead and dive on into this. Um, we have the minutes uh, of uh, February 15th. Thank you again, Erica. Bryce is here. I warmed it up for you. <laughs> Thank you. Any, uh, any motion to approve the minutes? Say that again, Gary. You don't have a microphone. I'm sorry. On the bottom of page six, huh? um, are, uh, that's to your left. That's to your left. Yes. Um, okay. Erica, were you intending that we put the um, put the uh, actual pictures of the projects in these minutes? Just just like a link of some sort, just okay. for whoever, if, you know, if someone does go to read the minutes, just that they'd have a corresponding link for the things that are talked about there, because they're listed, they're, they're numbered, they're, right. they're not specific, like, projects. Oh, I'm sorry, did I miss there? <laughs> Typo there, sorry about that. Yes, I meant, I meant to say link, not ink. <laughs> Do you have a, such a link? Northern. I can create one. Okay, if you would, and we will insert that. So there may be a better spot for that too, um, for the link, just for it, you know, because we addressed the agenda, so we y'all were going through line by line. Um, anyway, so that was just a suggestion. Good suggestion. Okay. Uh, with that that change, I, I'll 
move to approve the minutes. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes as uh, as it, uh, modified to provide a link. So moved. Got a minute. Second. Second. Any objection to approving these minutes as modified? Hearing none, minutes are approved. Was that by who seconded second. that? Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, first opportunity for public comment. Oh, also, I need to mention committee members. Mrs. Rudd, as you know, has uh, spent a great deal of time researching parts of Kendall County here. She's sent us some email or emails or attempted to send us some emails. Here in front of me, there's a stack of two sheets here, which is a two-page email, and another stack, which is a one-page email. She wasn't able to get it to everybody, so if you if you uh, would stop by after the meeting and grab those emails uh, for your files, I'm sure she would appreciate your interest. Uh, okay, going back to public comment, Ms. Rudd, I know you have a comment that you'd like to make. Again, three minutes. If you would, please, and we'll finish it up afterwards if you go I'll, around. I'll go as quickly as possible. The PowerPoint effort failed. I couldn't get the photographs. Um, Bob's just going to hold the placards for me. Your own Item Vanna 30. White. Huh? <laughs> Your own Vanna White. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to show this one. This is Item 33, extension of uh, Kreutzberg Road to 3351. And the public's welcome to see these as well after. This is a photograph of... Uh, Coyote Canyon behind my house. The elevation's about 1,100 feet. Uh, there are five canyons in the area of the Guadalupe River and Kreutzberg, um, 1,100 up to over 2,000 feet, very Kreutzberg Canyon natural area. These photos are um, the road le behind our area where I live leading down to the river. There are a series of four steep drops one, two, and three, and this is the final descent. All of these are stages, just to show you how steep some of the elevation changes are. This is a photo of the Kreutzberg Canyon Natural Area, a warning sign in front of the park warning you that the river floods within minutes under certain conditions with enough rain. They tell people to leave under when we have downpours or red or yellow on the radar. And this is a photograph of the river in one of those floods. My neighborhood park, it's very tiny, very simple, nothing fancy. I've seen that three times over the last few years since we moved there in 2017. And you're welcome to take a closer look. This river floods badly because of the canyons. Very quickly, a low water crossing would not do it. And it would also be a remote area with limited access to help people if they are trapped. And I will remind you that over the past few years, flooding has gotten worse. Multiple bridges have been washed out over the Blanco and the Llano Rivers. That's three bridges. So this would be a danger is just the flooding alone. I also uh, took the time with difficulty to show you pictures of Kreutzberg Road. In one direction, headed from where I live to FM 474, there are 10 sharp curve, blind curve speed reduction signs. And these are all pretty much different signs, um, different signs. I tried to get snapshots of the other blind curves that are not marked. There are others that are not even marked. I think the whole road would, frankly, be covered with signs from one end to the other. This is one uh, sharp curve 15. You can see uh, there's also driveways entering into the road. This is a residential area. Although it's a county road, a lot of homes are here, and their driveways emptying right into these blind curves. Uh, here is another one that's not marked. You can see some of the curves are tremendous. And here's another one where a fence was taken out. Um, this happens a lot. There are a lot of accidents at night. Typically, the police are not called. I suspect they're speeding or there's alcohol involved. I've picked up hundreds of beer bottles, beer cans, wine bottles over the past two years. I'm trying to keep it up. I'm just trying to make it look presentable. And over here, you can see there's a lot of elevation changes. A lot of flooding occurs. And you also notice there's no shoulder. Okay, I'll be back. Okay, thank you. Don't broken. charge me. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat>
Mr. Kyle, did you have your hand up that you wanted to speak? Good afternoon, Chairman Manning, Chairman uh, Durden, uh, the committee uh, committee members. My name is Lance Kyle. My address is 226 Cascade Caverns Road. Um, by the way, um, there are members of the Pfeiffer clan here today, the Altgelt clan, the Dolnick clan, the Massey clan, and I may have missed somebody, but there are uh, many members of the, uh, the old German families uh, from Ammon Road to Cascade Caverns Road and Old Fred Road here today. Um, also, Donna, I want to say um, I was impressed by your uh, comments in the recent Hill Country Weekly. I'm beginning to think you weren't an engineering major in school, but maybe an English lit major. All those colorful aphorisms. Rattlesnakes and uh, armadillos. Very interesting. <laughs> anyway, okay, so the title of my comments today, Roads Are Not Environmentally Friendly. Intrinsically Not Environmentally Friendly. There is no such thing as an environmentally friendly road, especially in Texas. The 12 mile long Wurzburg Parkway, which we've heard a lot about before, in San Antonio is not environmentally friendly and neither is the $700 million seven mile long Oak Hill Parkway in Austin. It was supposed to be environmentally friendly, but that was, that's $100 million a model, mile, that's what that's costing. And when you look for when you look for so-called green roads in this country, only one highway in Maryland, U.S. Highway 301, meets that definition according to the Green Highways Partnership. Another fantasy promoted by road builders is that highways can be built through environmentally sensitive areas with limited access, which in turn will limit development. But we know that doesn't work in Texas. Promises are made and then broken. We see that with the Wurzburg Parkway in San Antonio. The original plan called for a limited number of on-ramps and exits, but now it has over 20 access points, 40 if you count both sides. And the Wurzburg Parkway is four to six lanes wide, not just two lanes. As a result, development is proliferating around the parkway on properties that haven't been acquired by conservation groups. Maintenance programs and environmental protection devices like filter strips and filtration ponds are more science fiction reminiscent of the claims by developers at Shoreline Park. We all know what happens after the house or road is built and the contractor or de developer disappears. Maintenance departments take over and things fall through the cracks. An additional fallacy, and this is my last paragraph, Don, an additional fallacy is the suggestion that some land landowners are intellectually inconsistent when it comes to private property rights. A hundred years ago in Kendall County, private property rights were pretty much absolute, but the artificial influence of government policies like eminent domain and subsidized pipelines and highways, e.g. GBRA, SALS, TxDOT, has created these urban densities and forced rural landowners to seek protections from perversions of land use in the name of private property rights. Developers just are just taking advantage of the infrastructure. Add more of this infrastructure and more developers will come. The city of Austin has actually slow, slowed its urbanization by not being overly accommodative of the developers. We need the same policy here in Kendall County. We've already lost too much of our historic and natural appeal to bad, bad, blah, 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 bad land use policies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kyle. And just for clarity, uh, you're talking about the worst Bach. Parkway, correct? Not the Wurzburg Parkway. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Wurzbach. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. All right. Sorry. Make yeah. sure. Wurzbach, yeah. Any other individuals care? To yes, sir. I'm George Dolan, 223 Cascade If you would say that into the microphone so everybody that's on Zoom can. can I'm hear George Dolnick at 223 Cascade Caverns Road. I have tried to figure out exactly how you all have got this thing planned from where the entrance is on 46 to where the parkway exits at 281, I mean, excuse me, at I-10. Do you have any idea? I have no maps, I have nothing. And I'm sitting there and I'm wondering, how do I protect my property when I don't even know where you're going with this stuff? 
And I'm not real happy about that. I also find out that you've got a commissioner here that lives up in comfort. Where, where are we going with that one? So you, you don't, shouldn't even have any skin in the game if you're, going, if you're living in comfort. Matt, is that not correct? Well, uh, I'm a county commissioner, and I try to do what's best for the county, but please continue with your remarks. Is the, is the, is the city of Bernie the one that is pushing this, this more than the county? It looks to me, and it sounds to me from what I have tried to figure out, that the city has more skin in the game for this than you guys. But it affects all of us in the county. So what is the alternative? Can, can I come to your particular office and get a plat showing me where 40, the road from 46 goes to I-10? Hello? We usually don't respond to remarks, Mr. Dolnick, but I'll answer your question uh, very briefly. We do have not dr drawn any lines on a map, and that is the policy of this committee. We don't draw lines on maps across people's property unless we've talked to that property owner. And that's so that we don't affect their ability to market their property or their property values. And that was a lot of what we heard from people in the community. So there's not any attempt to hide anything from you. It's just our policy is there's, it would probably be from a traffic, pure, purely traffic standpoint, we need to find a way to get traffic off of 3351 and Herf Road or expand their capacities. Well, that was a real good move, wasn't it? Boy, they built that beautiful, wonderful parkway and now you've got people coming in from the north side where uh, uh, 46 comes in to Main Avenue. And now on the south side, and both of them come to 46. So you've got co traffic coming on, on Main Avenue coming from the north and from the south. Boy, that was a great idea. What I'm worried about is that's the same thing that's going to happen to this. And yet you telling me that we don't have any say in it because you don't have, the, you know, you can't do that because of the number of people that you have to deal with. I mean, I'm, I, don't, I don't quite, you won't give us a plat as to where 46, from 46 to I-10. And I don't, I don't get it. What are you, what are you afraid of? Sir, I, I think I might have a, just a thought for you. I, it's clear that I, I believe if you've been attending a lot of these meetings from the beginning. My wife has. Great. And, my, and I get the end results. Great. And that's the only reason why I'm here. I, I believe you'd realize that there's a, a wide variety of opinions on this committee between uh, myself, which is a seven-generation land-owning family, from Bernie since the beginning of the town. The Herf family is my, my grandmother's Juanita Herf, 99 years old, still lives here. Believe me, um, I know Peter Herf. Yep. He and I cut trees down on the Herf Ranch yep. years ago. That's the other Herf Ranch. Um, but, uh, but so we've been here for a long time. There's lots of people on this committee who share uh, many of your concerns. The only lines that we have drawn are lines that were submitted on the crowdsource tool from the public. When we provided the public with an opportunity to provide any ideas they have for the community, they submitted a whole variety of different, of different ideas. Those are the only lines we have right now and that we've been going through and discussing as a committee to see which ones have you know, any kind of merit at all and which ones don't. And so um, my sense is, uh, you'll find that this committee is made up of all citizens of the community who share many of your concerns. None of us are, very few of us are politicians or have any sort of uh, ulterior motive other than we live here and we're trying to find the best way to balance the private property rights and protection of the environment and land with recognizing that there are also traffic needs that we're trying to address as well. And so, I mean, your feedback is super valuable and I think knowing 
that there's places where people do not want a road to go through is also very valuable because I certainly do not want to put roads through people's properties who they intend to keep for long term and their families. So, so. Well, I understand the developers are the ones that pay, and if they can put more homes on somebody's property that has one home with an ag exemption, and you can put 15 or 20 homes, and each one of those homes are three or $400,000 a piece. It's more tax money in your pocket than you're getting from me as a, as a owner of 40, 40 acres. And I, I have, but, so, but not to waste any more of your time, and I know my time is up. So what you're telling me, when will we have an idea as an owner of the properties that we own and I'm not speaking just for myself. I won't tell you who else I'm speaking for. They can do it themselves. So I, but when will we have an idea as to where this thing that we have to have that was, is going to be like Herf Parkway, where are we going to, it won't be. It'll be better because you have one way on and one way off and you won't have two, people, two, two things colliding. But when are we going to find out whether or not we need to hire attorneys to Mr. fight this Dunley, thing. We're, we're way, way away so, from So that. It, it's not tomorrow, it's not next week, it's not next year, it's five or ten years from now. I, I'll give you a general scope. We, we intend to wrap up the work of this committee about mid-year. This committee will make some recommendations that go to the city council and to the city council of Fair Oaks and the county commissioner's court. They may take it and throw it in the trash. It may or may not include a road through or anywhere near your property. We don't right. know yet, right. honestly. But we're here to take your comments. We appreciate your comments. And I think it's pretty clear how you feel. Well, <laughs> And I appreciate that. As I mean, we've worked hard. I, you know, it, this was my mother-in-law and father-in-law's property. And we ended up, my wife and I and my two children bought it from them. And we've worked for the last 35, almost 40 years to get that property to where it is absolutely gorgeous. And I hate to lose it, but I sure would like to be able to know that I'm losing it for a good reason instead of a parkway. Uh, we hear you loud and clear, Mr. Dolny. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Can you restate the address one more time? 223 Cascade Caverns Road. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other commenters? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. My name is Donna Taylor. I am here representing the Cibolo Preserve 26 City Park Road. Our name kind of implies what I'm going to say. It probably doesn't even need to be said, but the Cibolo Preserve certainly hopes that the, the committee and all of its hard work and diligence recognizes the efforts that we place in the work that we do on the preserve, 653 acres that we preserve almost in the center of Bernie now since things are going east. Um, water quality, one of our biggest issues. We want every single person in our county and beyond to have clean drinking water. We work very hard to research those topics. And fragmenting the preserve or any other of the habitats that are along Cibolo Creek that contribute to that would be detrimental. So traffic is incredibly important to manage, but you have to weigh what What's the outcome? What, what are we willing to sacrifice? So on behalf of the Civil Preserve Board, we hope that you understand that we are opposed to any type of fragmentation of green space along the Civil Corridor that's being projected. And um, we're, I'm glad that all of you are putting the efforts and time and listening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor, for your comments and for your work uh, out there. Very good work. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Gerhardt. Felisa Gerhard, 103, and we have it. The question has been put forth to this community at least three times about a loop around Bernie through taxpayers' own pristine hill country landscape. Each time the community has clearly stated that a loop is not their vision of our county, but like a bad-tempered toddler, the cities and TxDOT keep coming back and demanding a different answer. It's like I didn't get my way, so I'm going to ignore the thoughtful response from so many, stamp my foot and ask again, again, and again until I get what I want. 
And if you don't agree this time, I'm just going to call you a bad name in the paper, you emotional naysaying Nellies, as the mayor so eloquently called the citizens of our county that didn't roll over and give him his way. I shake my head in disbelief. The powers that be, and now you as a committee, have been asked by the citizens to do what is right and to not be party to the use of eminent domain for the direct benefit of private industry, something that is used in New York City but shouldn't be used here in Texas. And don't sugarcoat it, this loop will not be for the benefit of the local residents, as you well know. During the last meeting, you spent over an hour discussing how to provide access to Esperanza to I-10. For access, they did not pay, I'm sorry, for access that they did not pay for outright, but are now asking you to provide. The city of San Antonio and the freight industry are using TxDOT as a heavy hand to use them in Devane for their direct benefit against the citizens of our county. So the taxpaying citizens are left fighting a common enemy, all with deep pockets and overreaching government authority for the direct benefit of private industry. Being one of only seven property owners, as Ms. Mr. Durden presented, I resent that I paid for without subsidy and special concessions will be compromised and taken away from the lining of other, of other people's pockets. This is a huge overreach of use of government, so I ask you, why do you as a committee continue to piecemeal approval of this unjust deceit? Because doing what is right was getting no response. The environmental issues were repeatedly brought to light. The eastern half of the county was documented as the absolute worst place to put in a road from K without a name to Cascade Caverns, and in particular the southeast segment. Studies and geological information were brought forward and presented again and again. The damage impact on our water supply has been clearly scoped. Mrs. Rudd has continued to apply with you thoughtful questions on impact and adequacies of after the fact cleanup, et cetera. She has also brought forward the air quality issues that Kendall County will be accepting by taking on the burden that San Antonio no longer wants to bear. Am I at three minutes yet? You have about 30 seconds. Okay. Why does San Antonio not want to bear this? Because it will cost them money. They want the citizens of Kendall to bear the financial cost. It has been repeated like the liberal press that these areas are being developed anyway. We should just put a road in. That is a flat out lie. There is no landowner on the map in the southeast quadrant that has a high density development in the works or planned besides Esperanza and the next phases of the lookout group. So again, putting out justification of taking from private citizens for the direct benefit of outside interest, but now harming not only the private citizens for the direct benefit of, I'm sorry, but now harming not only the landowners, but most every citizen in our region. So I ask again, why do you as a committee continue to piecemeal approval of this deceit that will impact the very air we breathe and the water we drink? And then we as the taxpayers will have to pay for the destruction of our own homes, pay for the building of the damaging roads, and then pay for the environmental damage both now and in the future. A clear lose-lose. Okay, I'm at three minutes, and I'm going to give... Mr. McCarthy, three minutes. Okay. That's okay with y'all. Wanda McCarthy, Ammon Road. I live next door to Via Lisa. <clears throat> no common sense or sense of ethics seems to stop this process coming back at us over and over again. The financial gain of a few is just too great. So the cities and TxDOT keep demanding again and again and again and are willing to exercise their club of eminent domain to get their way. And no make, make no mistake, you on this committee are holding the club in your hands over your neighbors' heads. Like Putin's invasion of Ukraine, the unwieldy powers that are swooping into our community, thinking they can overpower the citizens without much of a fight, all along while they hold a clear financial motivation. The only issue that appears to carry any weight in this fight is money and financial gain. Please know that comparables were established less than a mile from our home by TxDOT, no less, when they reserved a right-of-way for over $10 a square foot, again, less than a mile from my house. So the question is, just how bad do you want this? The citizens will not roll over for this invasion. We will stand united again. This will cost you both in time and in money, and which again seems the only deterrent that you will listen to. We, the citizens, will arm ourselves with eminent domain attorneys to fight the unjust use of eminent domain 
against us for the direct financial gain of private industry. We will arm ourselves with environmental attorneys to fight the utter destruction of our natural resources and an entire community's major source of water. We will stand together again and tell the cities in TxDOT who continue to act like toddlers, stamping their foot because they're not getting their way. We will, as a unified voice, once again, say no. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Harris, and I live at 749 Kreitzberg Road. Um, this is my first meeting I've attended. I want to thank everybody here who's been serving on this committee for giving your time. And I want to thank all of the citizens that have been coming to all of the meetings. I work a lot, so it's been hard for me to come. But, and I'm not all prepared. Everybody came with very prepared remarks, and I appreciate that. But I'm only going to speak to what I know of today, which is the road I drive in and out of every single day. It's about 15 minutes to the end and back. Very windy. She's done an excellent job documenting it. I would just say that before anybody recommended that as a thoroughfare, that you drive the road at night. It's extremely dangerous. I know it very well. I usually drive no more than 30 miles an hour at night because of how many animals. Even if driving that slow, I have hit animals and damaged my vehicle. Um, there's constantly wrecks, um, constantly. It's very difficult to get in and out of there. And then I don't really understand what the purpose would be of putting the road through because it would be so costly to put a bridge at the end. And you already have the bridge on um, 474 that runs through. I will admit, I used to work in Candelia, and I did cut through Cordillera. That was before George locked everything down, and you can't go anywhere. So I used to cut through that way and go up 3351 versus going up 474 and over. It was no time savings. So I don't even understand who would use that road, because if you live in Candelia and you're trying to get into Bernie, you're not going to drive that. You're going to either take the better roads that already exist, which would be 3351 South, and 474 in, or if you're living over on 3351, you already have access down to 46. So I'm not sure what population that would be serving or who it would benefit. That's really all I have to say today. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time, and everyone have a great rest of your week. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Any others? Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Jessica Pfeiffer Mines. Um, I'm the fifth generation to be raised on uh, 213 Cascade Caverns Road. I currently live on 12 Ammon Road. And I know my family has fought this before, and I don't, I'm not prepared. It's my first meeting, you know. Um, but <clears throat> I just really think Bernie has kind of went a direction that I never thought it would go, and all the talks and so looking at where this road could go, I, it's, it's not the town that it used to be. And it's really sad to see. And I just think that if a road goes through our ranch, which is one of the, the biggest ranches in Bernie left, um, so much environmental resources will be wasted. And it's just very sad. I really hope that you can help, you know, put this away for good so we have to stop fighting for our land. You know, it's, sorry, I'm nervous. Sorry. Right. <laughs> um, but I do appreciate you letting people come and speak and just know that, you know, we're not going to give up and we're going to fight it and we don't agree with it. And, you know, some of these new Bernie folks don't like the traffic. Well, shouldn't have built each house on top of each other. You know, you really should have thought about that beforehand. But I appreciate you letting me speak, and you guys have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, we will have another opportunity as we get close to the end of this meeting. Um, 
I'm going to skip the schedule review. I think everybody's got that spreadsheet, and you can see where we stand. I think we're pretty much on track. Uh, so let's go on down to the uh, subcommittee. Uh, I noticed that there has been something running. Steve, were you the one running that? It was. Uh, I think y'all had subcommittee had met, and y'all had some. Jonah, I think you were on that subcommittee. Had some suggestions for ways to improve traffic flow here that might obviate the need for another road. So, yeah. well, hopefully, we're going to see all, that. Thank you, I, um, and Steve. Thank you for we solved the technical problems from last time and. Steve has been able to work some really cool modeling magic. Um, can you explain, are, are we looking at the, okay, this is the modification that we created, right? Correct. Right. You want to talk through, I mean, you, you're the modeling guy. Why don't you talk us through it, unless you want me to. It don't matter. Uh, I mean, essentially. The same language. <laughs> I'll yeah, speak I, traffic engineer. Right, okay. I, will, I don't speak traffic engineer speak, so I'll be the Steve to translator. public translator. translate. He'll <laughs> anger translator. Um, so uh, essentially what, th what we did here is added a full-time designated right turn off of Herf Road going north. So you can see as you're going north on Herf Road, you can turn right onto uh, River Road there continually, regardless of his, if the light is red or green, you can always turn right there. Um, and there are also now two left turn lanes from uh, River Road, if you're uh, heading west, and trying right now you're trying to turn left onto Herf Road. There's two designated left turn lanes, so the cars there can queue up without extending way, way back and blocking people who are trying to turn right onto Esser. What else was added here, Steve? I'm we trying made to the uh, left turn bay longer on southbound Esser. Right yeah. We, we split out a designated right turn on, um, yeah, right there, when you come in south on Esser to turn onto River Road. So, so the basic concept of wide nodes, narrow roads, means that instead of having to build big, wide roads everywhere in a town, you can get away with narrow roads, uh, which have a surprisingly high carrying capacity for vehicles, but the nodes, the intersections, are where the problem is. And so if we designate more space and really focus our efforts on making a wide, larger intersection, we can have a lot more capacity without the need to expand a lot of roads. My understanding, I don't know if you have the numbers handy, Steve, but this, this right here carried about double the capacity that the current configuration did. Is that a no, fair statement? That's the existing traffic volume that we have. Right now we we're looking at existing traffic. Right. Oh, why don't we look at that again knowing that? Because, because essentially with the existing traffic volumes that we have now, you can tell that, that if this was the intersection design, most cars are getting through the first time the light turns green. There's, there's a really a pretty good flow. The one thing we were not able to solve is the, the queue on River Road for people on River Road coming east. That continues to back up because we can't get people the opportunity to turn right there. I, I realize it's a little bit difficult to talk through and follow. Well, but. although we, we didn't play with uh, right-of-way, uh, claiming any right-of-way on the north side of uh, River mm -hmm. Road there, uh, where we potentially could have created a two-lane uh, flow coming from, what, the west, you know, from Main Street across. River, but not long. Yeah. But not long. But That's not right. long. No, there, there is. That's right. There's constraints. Yeah, there are some constraints. And I should point out, this, this is the AM right. And so, it, it works pretty well in the AM, yeah. the Q mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. So this is basically the the peak worst traffic in the morning time. And in my opinion, that if this is what we had right now, I don't think we'd have complaints about the intersection. Still okay, that, that's in the AM, but then when I get to the PM, yeah, that's so when we still have issues with that configuration. If, I don't know if y'all call calling that. Yeah, but that's, they do. No, this, this is the PM. And this is where the queue on River Road starts to really back up. Yeah, and I'm zooming out. Yeah. You see it? Yeah. Yeah, it backs up past the apartments. Right, I mean, it's past the apartments today, so. 
Yeah. So, so we didn't solve every problem that's out there, but it felt like we were able to solve a lot of problems without really a significant amount of additional right of way acquisition. Um, was there any right of way acquisition needed to expand this intersection? That that right turn off of Esser, uh, when you're I'm sorry, when you're headed west on 46 and you turn right, we moved that closer to the gas station there. So it's in that little floodplain spot below mm -hmm. the wall, the retaining wall that they have. So I don't know, do they own that spot or not? South, the southeast corner, the southwest corner of the gas station. The southwest. So that, yeah, that's that's existing right away. Okay. So, so it's the southeast corner. We would need a portion of the southeast corner from. Yes. And we oh. need a portion of the northwest corner from the nurse. There's two right away. There's we two dis parcels we would have to acquire. We did discuss that. Right here, where I'm circling the mouth. Yeah. Right there. Have to yeah. So, so in summary, being part of the subcommittee, in summary. It, it improves it, it improves the volume of traffic and the speed in which you're going through that intersection, particularly when you use Herf Road, right? We did not consider some of the right-of-way costs. We did not uh, assume or consider any of the environmental costs in that southeast section. Uh, but, yes, uh, it, there are ways to improve this intersection that create a better access in or through through Herf Road. Is that no, I think that's summary. But uh, let me ask the clarifying question. If I seem to remember somebody shared a concern that somebody, I don't know if it was the city or text dot had on the last time we looked at this, that the idea of somebody's coming down Esther Road and wanting to, to head east of 46 that the radius of that curve was not amenable to 18 wheelers. Right. Or have you solved that or violated that with this scenario? We, I don't, we didn't solve it. No. I think we, we did leave this. I mean, this is not, I, I feel like when we never really completed the model in a way because we didn't play with how to solve that, but we did talk about it. So, yeah. we, this, we can't, it would be difficult for a WB62 to make that left turn from southbound Esser. To eastbound I'm going to translate. I believe that means a big truck. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. So we knew this didn't work, and then so uh, Ben or Jonah had the idea of the acceleration lane right here. If you're seeing that, that's that third lane, mm -hmm. and this is the PM again, and you can see. If we can, it's like an acceleration lane for these guys that are turning right. So they're continuing. They got their free right, just like we said before. But you're adding a, an extra lane for these guys to accelerate and then weave over into the second lane. So this requires even more right away. But this allows for. You see how there's two through lanes right there? So that's the only way to kind of clear out where the road in the mm -hmm. And that requires even more road. Right you can see we're getting into the trees. Yeah, I so, will say on the on the tree mm -hmm. question, um, at least so when you're on Herf Road going north and you want to take that right turn, that would require an additional lane on that bridge. That's an engineering problem that engineers will have to solve. <coughs> I have gone through there and looked. It doesn't look like there's any heritage cypresses there. It doesn't look like there's any major. I mean, there might be a few smaller willow trees that are that grow really fast in, in riparian areas. So, um, I just wanted to bring that up. I, I think, and I also think that this is the work of a couple of hours of a few of us just kind of playing around to play. If you had somebody spend some real time, an engineering firm or somebody really trying to work through the problems, knowing all the other issues about um, where infrastructure is and um, like utilities and stuff. Um, I think they, th I think what this shows is, hey, I think there's some possibilities, ways, you know, real ways to improve it. Yeah. So you're reducing the wait time from six cycles down to possibly one. So I did summarize. Well, what is the level of service change, Steve, mm -hmm. as well as Kind of just one of the. Instead of just doing level of service, I did a delay. Okay. Here's our existing AM. So Eastbound River Road, you wait on average a vehicle waits about five minutes. 
and it's probably longer, but you got to realize that it's starting at the beginning of the peak hour and going to the end of the peak hour. So it's an average across an hour. So they wait about five minutes in the morning based on the model. In the afternoon, it's about the same. Again, this is the Eastbound River. And then this is the third column is our improvements. And you can see we've reduced delay by, you know, it's under a minute now. So it, it's significant. Yeah. So it goes from level of service F and uh, it'd be roughly a level of service D, E in mm -hmm. our improvement. And this is that 220 seconds is before we added that second lane for the PM. Remember how I said we added that third lane? Mm -hmm. So it was still bad without that third lane. Now the fifth column is when we added that extra lane to go through from Eastbound River, you know, crossing her. So, and then just for the, because uh, I think Ben asked me to look at the roundabout. I did look at it as a single lane. I didn't show it because it's a mess. So I did do a two lane roundabout. It's a two lane. Yeah. And I'm just going to just answer the one question. I think this is more of a hypothetical test about level of service. Clearly, a roundabout built in that exact configuration over the river would be not optimal. Like, it could be moved in some way. Yeah, you'd have to move it because I did pull up the design standards again for traffic. But you need a 200-foot radius for this roundabout in order to... And so I did design it at a 200 foot radius. It's not a design, but in my model, I did make this. This is what the footprint would look, you know, if you didn't shift it. So it's just, I think, Ben, you'd ask me to see about the roundabout. So I threw it in there. It worked pretty well outside of this one movement here because you had a lot of, sorry, I can't see my mouse. What is the traffic here? Is this AM or PM? This is the PM. Okay. And it's because these guys going westbound on river. Mm -hmm. are going through so they're not allowing the southbound esser people to enter into the roundabout because you got they're just waiting and there's just not enough room mm -hmm. but it gets pretty i mean you can kind of see all the movements in the roundabout you know it's it'd be pretty harrowing i, I think <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what's, what's paradigm the shift there huh? there is a thing called turbo a turbo roundabout <laughs> Which will separate the movements mm -hmm. and like Sweden and Europe use that, and it seems to work pretty well over there. So. You can't model it. A turbo. turbo. Can you model? You can't model it. That's I can do it way more. Okay. Do you have, you do have the bypass lanes? It looks like here on the southeast corner you have a bypass lane, and the northwest or north corner, whatever you want to call it, you have bypassed. So you don't even have to enter t into the roundabout. So if you're yeah, northbound yeah, Herf, outside. you can kind of hug that outside and yeah. get right. So, uh, Can I ask that uh, we've had a complaint registered here by the wonderful technology of cell phones. That there's some multiple conversations going on out there. Some people are trying to listen to what we're saying. So if you got a conversation you need to have with your neighbor back there, if you could take it out while you have the conversation, I think your neighbor down there who wants to listen and, and we would appreciate that. So thank you very much. Please continue. Jeff, is this something that the Kimley Horn folks could look <coughs> at while they're doing our work for the city on mobility? Could they take two examples that the subcommittees proposed sure. and just give it their once over and, and, and scrub it a little bit from an engineering traffic standpoint? C correct. And the other, the other thing that our, our Kimley Horn is working for us on is this is a snapshot of this one particular intersection. Um, we're in process of building a model for the entire city because how we can see how in, something at this intersection might affect other intersections. But, yeah, that's something that we can look at once we get that model all put together. And who would have to improve this? Would this be TxDOT or would it be us or a combination of the two? It's, it is a TxDOT roadway, um, so it would, but more than likely it would end up being a combination of the two to help them motivate to get it done. Otherwise, it will just be on their 2050 plan and it will move to the 2070 plan or whatever. Okay. So. Okay. And would they be willing to do this without raising it? Or would they want to raise it out of the flood plan? So TxDOT is talking about updating their drainage rules. In general, City of Bernie requires people to design for a 100-year flood. TxDOT designs a whole lot of stuff for the 5- and 10-year floods. Um, way, in my mind as an engineer, way dangerously undersized. But that's what TxDOT does. Um, 
we would want them to design this for a hundred year. Um, and as we know from our drainage analysis, this intersection is nine and a half feet underwater in a hundred year flood. Because we've discussed before that the safety risk and safety hazard of not doing something here that lifts it out of the floodplain because in a massive rainfall event, you can't get out to any of the homes, you know, east of that um, gas station there on 46. Correct. There's no way to access those folks in an emergency. Correct. Yeah. And actually, just to clarify, there is an emergency pass through through Champion. Through Champion. We have, there, we Champion have an emergency that connects to Bentwood. Bentwood. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that, so there is a way for fire and emergency vehicles to get through if there's a flood, but there's not really a good you know, alternative route for traffic if it's flooded. And that, that is something we've talked about for this committee as a whole. There's two gates in town that I think the committee is talking about requesting they open those gates. Right. So. And that pass through is one of them? Correct. Okay. Thanks, Joe. So I was just going to throw something out. So one thing that's not currently shown or solved for in these models is pedestrian traffic. But, you know, as you cr approach uh, Main Street uh, from you know, River Road along the duck pond, obviously it goes below the bridge. And I could see us uh, solving that with a similar solution where a path would, would go down underneath the bridge and uh, actually solve a lot of trans of, of hassle and safety concerns. For and elevating it to the 100-year. Mm -hmm. The roadway. Yeah, well, sure, if you, yeah, yeah, you want to. Even now, it could probably be, you could probably go down and hug the sure, creek. Sure. But are you talking about connecting the number nine? Yeah, all the uh, way out. Not really connecting number nine. That's another issue entirely. This would just about abrogate anybody trying to navigate that intersection. Well, in terms of people, grade, yeah. Yeah, yeah, at grade, yeah, it wouldn't work for pedestrians or bikes. Steve, yeah. I'm wondering it, the schematic that TxDOT did for roundabout at that location in the report not to be named was was <laughs> that did that not meet the design standards for a roundabout? I don't think it had. It was a single lane roundabout from what I saw. I and thought it was a double lane roundabout. Northern, do you happen to recall? Do you have... W which location? At this location, TxDOT uh, drew a mock-up of a roundabout. And I recalled it being a double lane roundabout. But if it... Um, if it... It, it would just seem that it would be odd because they, they seemed to have it fitted in that location quite well. But maybe it just was grossly, uh, you know, did not follow design standards. I think John Kite did one. I think he may have, too. Here she goes. Um, yeah, that looks very conceptual. It doesn't have any radiuses on there and stuff. Yeah. It doesn't look like 200 feet. Just no. no, no, it's not. Um, I, I did put a version of that Um on top, I, I cut it out in Photoshop and put it on top of the map so you can see where that fits. But basically, the, the two lanes going south are the same bridges where they currently are, and, and east and west, the roads are still where they are. So this, the whole thing is moved north, essentially. But it is, it is certainly smaller than the design that you had. Um, so maybe it was just a conceptual idea. Who knows? I think so. Yeah. Well, Jonah, let me, I'm going to tag on that just for a minute because I, I think it highlights the importance of how we phrase our ultimate recommendations. We really need to believe in what we're recommending and encourage the people that we're handing us off to that have the Kimberly Horns under contract to do engineering design and that have the access to TxDOT to request approval for some future funding that we actually mean it. In my experience, in my perspective, there's this tendency when people just make a general recommendation, put a roundabout at Esser, Herf, and River Road to be told, thank you very much, it doesn't work, we've looked at it. They put it in the trash can and move on, and I think if this committee believes otherwise, we need to be pretty emphatic about saying, put some creative minds to this thing. We think, based on our work, that something here can be measurably improved and we we are imploring you to do something about it i think it could work something will work here but i'd hate to see it just be told no because somebody's already looked at it it didn't fit somebody's design criteria out of a manual that's 75 years old and I, I, don't, I don't think that that's the right answer well i think i think i think you're saying that kimley horn can and, yeah. and, and yes, not only that can. 
Uh, not only that, I think what I was also hearing you saying is that we want to see this modeled. Like, you know, we have all these other traffic concerns around it, say, coming off of River Road from Maine, and that we might be able to solve some of those traffic pressures using a more holistic approach with more intersections, more mm -hmm. pathways. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Well, I want to thank the subcommittee for the very fine work they've done here. I think it shows that uh, just a little bit of creativity and thoughtfulness goes a long way to improving uh, traffic and and I think that our recommendation uh, uh, Jeff you can carry this forward if nobody objects it I think we would like to see uh, mm -hmm. uh, Kim Lee Horn study or whoever y'all choose to study both options just with the intent of improving this and uh, I think that hopefully this will make its way into the final report so that you're ahead of the curve when that recommendation finally gets to you in the report but uh, great work, and uh, I think it shows the, the value of the committee of just people that aren't necessarily traffic experts, to, but uh, find a way to bridge that gap. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Especially Steve, thank you. He, he did a lot of time and expertise and free. Heavy lifting. Heavy li yeah. Thank you. Did they buy you a beer? Nope. No. <laughs> no, we did. We did have a beer. Bobby. 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 I did. Way to go, Bobby. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> All right, I hope everybody brought their package of, of <laughs> projects from the last meeting. Gary, good luck. Assume you're leaving. Um, Don't forget we, to vote, Gary. We want to... Uh, <laughs> we'd like to uh, move on into item uh, 6A here. Uh, as you recall, the last meeting we had 20 projects that we had listed. Uh, in that package that um, the subcommittee of Northern, uh, Bob and I, uh, we had taken those and said, these are comments that we have received from the public. We think that they're either redundant or they're out of scope or they don't make sense. And so we would like to just save the committee from going through those one by one. And so what we'd ask you all to do is go through there and see if there are any of them that we want to pull from that and then once we pull the ones that we want to carry forward to talk about whether we want to carry into the next step, we will dispense with the rest of them as a group. Is that clear? Okay. Would, would it be appropriate to ask Northern to just very quickly go through, here's what, here's what they all are, and then we have a decision point after at the end of going through those? The public can see them just real quick. Well, we, I, it's okay with me if y'all are willing to do that. It's going to extend. We were already at, at 3 o'clock, but, I mean, I'd rather take time and do it where everybody's comfortable than, than rush this process. Northern, do you think you could do that in, in three minutes or something? Just say, here's the, here's the different projects that we have that are part of this? I don't think that's a yes or a no. <laughs> She, got, she has it up. Okay. Is there, is there a way to get that up on the screens in front of us? For some reason, it's no longer doing that. Yes. I bet there is. Yeah, yeah I see them. We have oh, good help. Yeah. There's no way we don't have to crane our necks and look behind us at the thing. I brought my package. I, brought mine. I did too. Prepared. And left it in my car. Yeah. 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 It's safe there. All right, Norley, you going to just flash them up there? Okay. Or just the ones that then asked to be pulled. No, he, he wants to. He wants to say we we'll go through each one Sit of these through, twenty real quick and say Great. this is what All this 20. is. Yeah. Well, I feel like we already did that one. That was great. Let's just we're just a brief, so the public can briefly see. Like, here's the 20 projects. Oh, in but some of these have been asked to be pulled. Right. Specifically, been asked that they be pulled out of that group and honestly looked at. Okay. So then, yeah. So then, those we'll we'll look at. Yeah. Yeah. But you want to look at all of them, real quick. A long list. Just identify. Just them. A, okay. just really quick. Just yeah. Just to quickly identify. Here's the ones that were. All right, are you ready for a lightning round, Northern? Yeah. yeah. All right, the first one is, is Project 34. It's the extension of a road from Sisterdale Road over to I-10, uh, somewhere around Bent Tree Subdivision. We said that's not needed to aid congestion. 
Uh, the next one is project number 39. It is the extension of um, Road connecting Balcones Creek to Bernie yeah, Stanch. This is one that I think Bitsy asked to be pulled. Uh, it's actually in Bear County, south of Balcones Creek. And it goes from Bernie Stage Road over to an existing road. Not in our county. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, Bitsy says it, it, it is germane to our transportation because it does provide an alternate route to I-10. So we're going to talk about it. So we're going to talk about oh, we are that. Bitsy oh, asked. Oh, I see. That one will be pulled. Okay. Okay. Uh, because, okay, so down below where that said that it's not going to actually apply. We're that's right. Okay. That, that was our recomm initial recommendation. Okay, next one, Project 51. This is basically 3351. Uh, we said uh, that the text dot plan is to address 3351 in its entirety, and we, we should not really be discussing that any further. The next one, I, Project 77 is more or less a repeat of the first one that we did, which was 34, roadway between 1376 and I-10. Uh, there was actually, this was a comment that this is a sensitive area. And so uh, I think that we actually should include this one in the other group that we acknowledge the comment. Okay. Next one, 78, same situation, same place. It's a comment about a sensitive area for that roadway, and we would move, move that to the next group. Uh, the next project is uh, Project 87, which is a roadway over there parallels Main Street between Tyson and Newfort, Newton, Newton. Newton Street, uh, and we said that uh, is redundant to the existing creek trail, the Kill Country Mile. And we suggested it be uh, no longer considered. Uh, the next one is um, Project 91. It's very similar to the first one that we considered, maybe a little bit farther north. It's a roadway between um, Sister Dale Road and I 10. We recommend it be pulled. Uh, this next one, Project 114. Uh, it is a roadway that goes, again, from Sisterdale Road, more or less through um, Bent Tree Subdivision or by Bent Tree Subdivision, down to the north interchange at 87. So congestion is not severe in this area, and so we recommend that it be pulled. 127 is a roadway that uh, resembles um, the... Um, gateway. Uh, there are components of this discussed elsewhere. We think this is redundant. It's too much to take off in one bite, so we recommend that project be discontinued. Project 135 is a huge recommendation that we take traffic off of 46 by taking it north on essentially the extension of 3351 up to 473. Uh, we said don't include that in recommendations. There's not much congestion in that area, and we shouldn't spend much money on those two textile roads. Uh, the next one, Project 155, uh, it's a, another pretty significant project that goes from 474 cross country, a green, greenfield alignment over to Sisterdale Highway then down Sisterdale Highway to some point around Bent Tree and then tying in. Uh, we, we don't see that it adds congestion, it aids congestion. We recommend that that be pulled. Project 156 is the extension of a local street by the name of Wolschlager Drive uh, over to Pfeiffer Road. The Greenfield Project, we don't think there's any congestion there that would be disruptive to those neighborhoods. And we recommend it be pulled. Project 167 is a very short piece. I think this was a comment in response to another citizen suggestion. Uh, the comment was that this is a sensitive area, and uh, so we think we should acknowledge that comment moving into that acknowledge comments group. Project 170 is clearly... Uh, 
an inebriated attempt to <laughs> replicate the uh, southwestern part of the gateway project. We think it should be pulled. Thank you. <laughs> 177 is, um, it, it is a piece, it may have been the comment, uh, the citizen suggestion that that area was um, responding to, oh, this is another one, it's a sensitive area, and we would acknowledge the comment. It doesn't help any congestion no. issues. No. 179 is a little bit outside of our scope and that it's up <laughs> around San Marcos. So uh, the next one, 180, again, a little outside of our scope. It's south of San Antonio. Another one is 181, northeast of San Antonio. Uh, 205, now this is, a, this is the stretch, okay? We're talking about rerouting it through Austin, okay? <laughs> Uh, 218, uh, this is uh, a, the caveman uh, interpretation of the gateway project. We recommend that be pulled. Gateway, 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 gateway box. That was the 20th. So that was the 20. No. That was quick. Okay. Ding, ding, did we make it? Good job, sir. Yep. <laughs> so, so, so the uh, only thing that changed from the last meeting, Mr. Chair, is 39. That's the only one that I know of. I don't know if other committee members. I think John's are on. I think those John's are. Oh. Committee so I'm going to suggest that somebody make a motion that we dispense with these projects, except for the ones that are, say, comment acknowledged, and that we move those to. The comment acknowledged list. Take me on from the 39 here. Uh, and, and pull 39. Is that green? So right moved. <laughs> I like your style. Second. Is there any objection to to dispensing with all of the projects in these 20, except for project 39 and except for the ones that say comment acknowledged? 39 makes sense. Uh, so any, no objection. any objection to that? No objection. Okay. By consensus, those are dispensed with and dealt with as recommended. Wow, you just knocked out a big bunch there. Done by 3.30, sir. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's have a, a brief discussion about how... the. We want to acknowledge these projects uh, or these comments that people have made that, that they're valid comments. They just don't lead to a project. Uh, Bobby, you had made a suggestion last time that all the objections be placed in one place. Um, maybe we take these comments and put them in a place in the report and say we acknowledge those, or maybe we just reference them in the database because, I mean, we're going to be referencing this database. So what, what's y'all's preference? And if y'all recall, it's, we just need to treat all of the comments the same. We, uh, if we have uh, Joe Q. Public coming in and saying, I don't want you going through my property. We need we need to acknowledge that, and, and that data needs to be all in the same place, not redundant. Any other place where we're piecemealing different concerns, all of them in one place, place, so we can turn it over to the city if they can use that in their study. As th these, this is what we received. Here it is. I wonder if it's it's almost the pros and cons of different projects. You know, if there's mm -hmm. things that we identify as, oh, yeah, this sounds like a great project, but here's all these potential, you know, problems with it. Um, I think it's important to capture that stuff and provide it along with a recommendation so it isn't just viewed as, like, you know, oh, yeah, this will solve the problems. Like, here's this might have some significant issues. There. I don't know how to capture other than in Northern's Airtable database here. Um, 
I don't think we should discount the legacy of the database. It, it's there, yeah. and it's there to be referenced 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. And the people that are getting up speaking about their concerns about anything, it's going to be there. It's in the minutes of these meetings. It's, it's there. So I, I, don't, I don't think we should publish a 1,000-page report just so we can verbatim put all the comments <coughs> made about every project. The standalone. That, that, that's not what I expect to be done in my concern. No. Uh, thousand, there is no report of negative or positive concerns. It's just the data needs to be the same. If we bring up a concern on this sheet, then tied to this project, we need to address those concerns as well. Either we put them on or we take them off, all of them. And we just keep it in the data that comes into Northern through each crowdsourcing comment. And the minutes, and okay. that's where we tell the city, here are the crowdsourcing comments, and here are the minutes to the meeting. Well, early on, we had a, a lot of conversation about what do we do with public comments. I mean, Jonah and I had a lot of conversations about it. And, and I think we wound up that we weren't going to, we weren't going to modify any comments from the public, that we were going to preserve the comments out of respect for the public, whether they're right, wrong, or indifferent, or whether we agreed with them or not, we're going to preserve those. But our, our, our task was to take that information and refine it into something that was coherent and could be the basis of our recommendation. And so I think if we I don't think we ought to take these and do anything different with them. But if we do come up, we're going to start getting in projects that we are going to recommend. And if these are relevant to those projects, I think we should extract some information and say, okay, here's a project the committee's recommending. We receive comments, mm -hmm. and you can find it on comment number 89 or something like that. And, Don, I, I also wonder, um, uh, as we start moving forward to the real consideration of the final list of projects that are going to be recommended, that... Uh, the, que the comments that we have for that project might be more than what was originally captured. I, um, I'm just, I get a hunch from the people that are sitting here watching us that they're in, engaged and, and have opinions about stuff and, and might want to share those opinions with us. And so, um, so I'm wondering, uh, is this idea that you're talking, are you thinking more about capturing the old data that's there or also as people come up and give comments or give feedback or... How do we capture that additional from, from landowners who come and say this uh, this project damn you know impacts my property? Do we is there a way to incorporate that mm -hmm. as part sure. of this too? Sure. Sure. Just sure. one sure. little um, thought. What you see on your screen right now is the map of the database that that and it is a relational database. That's what all the lines you see are. So when we talk about adding things to the database, um, I am somewhat reluctant to do that because it can start throwing errors in the database because of all these relationships. All of the tables have set fields and they are in relationships with fields on other tables. So if we want to add to the, the tables in the database, I, um, I would want to be very cautious about doing that. But we could, we could extract a project out of there and yes. put it in a new database and then add things to that, correct? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, based on our recommendations. It's, otherwise, we're, what we're doing is we're, we will continue to look at crowdsource data, and we've been through it a number of times. And I, I'm not sure the report will be as focused as it needs to be and it should be based on our recommendations and not on everything that the crowdsourcing data has in it. Because as we just went through, there are some projects here that we're not going to go forward with. And therefore, it's still in crowdsourcing. So if it isn't part of our recommendations, I, I don't think it would be pertinent for our report. It's too big, and it's not the purpose <coughs> of why we're here. Because the deliberations will cut out the projects we're not going to support whether it's in crowdsource or not, because we've considered it. I mean, that's been the approach all along. It just takes so long. 
In other words, why put things in here that, that um, summarize all the data in crowdsourcing when we have that tool to go to if it's one of the projects we're looking at? Just focus on the ones we're going to recommend. I mean, that would be my... We can reference this as an appendix or another resource. Exactly. It's disappear. Fine. That's fine, yeah. I get it. Are we good? That would be fine. Mm -hmm. So we're going to... Uh, okay, I've got it. I think clear in my mind. Is it clear in your mind? Clear as mud. Okay. I'll give it a try. <laughs> I'm, I'm, in my mind, I'm already fast-forwarding to when we're standing before a city council or county commissioners express, you know, sharing summaries of our recommendations. And I, what I love, I think it's imperative that they be one project per page. It's my career taught me one thing, people, that particularly that if there's any kind of technical content to the presentation, get completely lost in the weeds. And so if we can just make this brutally simple, here it is, here's the here's the cost, here's the crowdsourcing summary, here's the problem it's going to solve. Those things that we've identified as a committee that deserve to be on this one sheet need to be on this one sheet. And certainly for anything we're going to recommend, if there was relevant crowdsourcing information to summarize on that, do it. Um, to me, that I think that appendices, so, appendices yeah. is a great place to put a lot of that stuff, yes. like detailed it, comments and things that you can look up later. It is. We just we have to we have to recognize that we need to interpret our own work and make it understandable by the bodies who sent us here. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a ch challenge in and of itself that I'm, I believe in very strongly. I like the idea of an appendix mm -hmm. or appendices. I like it a lot. In fact, I think. I, I want to say I remember that the Gateway Project was annotated that way with the comments at the very back of the project summary uh, such that you could reference back to the recommendations and then the comments from the crowd. Mm -hmm. it, it was fairly easy to, to get to the opinions uh, that were expressed. And Bitsy, it's just based on our recommendations, though. That's what, what I'm getting at, is that that ought to be the focus. When we get to that, those deliberations, what are our recommendations and, and what was the information provided to us, and go forward, not on everything that we've been presented um, in the crowdsourcing data. You follow me? Especially so those that we just said, we just recognized and we just put aside. Said it doesn't have anything to do with this committee or the county. Mm -hmm. We don't need, we don't need to follow those. No, yeah, I I understand that though. So, but the appendices should have the relevant the comments on the recommended projects. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, we've been asked to make recommendations, right? So we ought to support those recommendations, but also give the contrary opinion, uh -huh. right? Even though there are right. pros and cons to everything, right. uh, on the weight of the balance, we suspected that this was a project worth pursuing. But there's these other issues out here like what they just showed with respect to Esser, River, Herf. Um, you know, you can fix some of that traffic for the AM peak hours, but maybe not fix it for the PM peak hours. Mm -hmm. that, needs to be, that needs to be stated. Mm -hmm. Being very transparent, I did go back and think, what did I blow up last time? And I went through all of these projects, and I realized the only one that had a comment in the section, <clears throat> sensitive features identified via transportation committee crowdsourcing map the only one that had a comment and the only comment was about her French not to pick on you mm -hmm. but we got to be fair to all of them mm -hmm. and so maybe even just taking that out and once we do get the recommendation recommended words we just the uh, projects we need to have appendices that shows everybody's positive or negative comments bingo final report? yes okay. I will show you the draft that I created. This is a draft. Yeah, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> He's playing with his ball. It even says yeah. draft. It says draft. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I mean, she knows what she's doing. <laughs> this is just a working model that I had up. Um, and I will fit as many things on the page as I can. 
um, for our final recommendations. Okay. Even if, even if it's a summary. And no, no, I think just you just continually make us look like we know what we're doing. I appreciate <laughs> Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> you and Steve. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, um, just a sort of uh, time management here. We're at 3.30. How many people want to comment, public comment in the second half? I know, Ms. Rudd, do you want to finish up? Any other <coughs> commenters out there? Okay, so we have one. So I'm going to suggest that we go ahead and we start tackling into the five projects that warrant our full, full deliberation here. Those will be found, uh, if you go from the back of your uh, thick packet, um, about 12 pages, the first one of those is project number 16. And this is 5E, this, um, this group? It was, it was uh, the last meeting's 5D group. Is that correct? 5D. 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 <laughs> And what we would want to do with these action that we want to do with these is do we want to leave this in and carry it forward for further consideration as a final recommendation or do we want to reject it from future consideration? I think this should be considered. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of talk about needing a connection between River Road and, and Esser Road. And um, this could provide that at a much reduced cost to a longer alternative that I may have a biased opinion about. My, my opinion is that this project is needed with that other project that we were that, that we discussed. Uh, this project will tend to take traffic from neighborhood or subdivision to subdivision, not from region of city to region of city. I think we, I used that, that language before. It's just, you, you don't want to, you don't want to promote cut through traffic. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. without that other pro project, uh, I think you'd see some cut through traffic if we don't do that other project. Any yeah. objection to no I think I think I think Bobby's right and, and Jonah too I think it needs to stay in because it deals with that security safety issue I raised earlier especially if you know Esser Herf 46 is underwater or under reconstruction mm -hmm. you've got to access 46e some way and that provides that mechanism which is a very short term relatively low cost exp exp expansion can, can we just state that the the way that line is drawn I, I, that's, I'm not beholden to that. That's what I was about yes. to bring up. The way the line yeah. is drawn, this goes through like 40 houses. We yeah. can't do that. I, I think the concept of the connection is valid, but the location, I don't think anyone here is proposing we're going to draw a line through 40 yeah. houses. Is there a stub backing or off of uh, Esperanza that way? No. That's right. Yeah. Um, that is tying into a residential neighborhood over at Bernie High School in, in that area, so I think it, about, I think there needs to be something to be said about right-sizing the road. I mean, yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's also yes. a gated subdivision. Yeah, so all, all the, so this this is showing going to Esperanza Boulevard, mm -hmm. which is a public which is not road, gated. but all the other side roads in Esperanza are all are behind gated. gates, and so yep. it, it would take an action of the HOA and removing yeah. gates and all the, um, so, so from complicated. A, I guess, can I summarize it? We're willing to carry this forward to further consideration and additional clarification. We think it may address congestion and it may or may not make the final cut. Everybody happy with going forward? Yep. 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 Yes. With the additional caveat that that is not the line that we're proposing. Right. We're simply saying going from point A to B. And right. we may find that it stopped at Champion Boulevard instead of Esperanza because of the logistics that Jeff is mentioning and all those homes on Esperanza, but some connection to Bentwood towards Champion Boulevard and Esperanza makes sense. I think the next project, uh, Project 117, is a similar representation of that, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Is that correct, Jim? Mm -hmm. Correct. So we would carry that forward as well. With the same purpose and the same definitions from A to B, Yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pick one of those two and make some modifications to it if we choose to. Any 
objections. This is largely a greenfield road yeah. project. And I don't like it. <laughs> I just, there's a lot going on here. You've got Fair Oaks, you've got that new development, Lemon Creek. There's, there's a whole host of stuff that's got to happen. I just don't think this makes any sense. I don't see it happening. That's getting built right now. The, I understand the property was just sold. I mean, this is one of those examples is, will, will development lead to a connection regardless of what we decide here and do we need to do we need to recommend something so that when development comes the city knows what to also say developer you need to build this not so can, well, you, can you explain that so what you're saying is it, I guess it, I just stand up a lot of this that, little this piece right here a lot of that a lot of that's being sold is what I'm understood I don't know for that that area for, uh, west of Fredericksburg Road mm -hmm. starting at the Balcones Creek and going north of north. Fredericksburg and then turning this is Geneva and going to the west that area in the southwest yeah. part of that most of that is Lily Ranch yeah, there's a couple of other Geneva parcels in there Geneva. and then there's some other stuff Geneva. west of Lily Ranch down. Uh, and, and, and I mean yes I, I don't see that this is relevant and yeah. I, I think we should develop development's going to do it anyway yeah I, figure so it out. yeah we let them figure it out this is what you're saying okay uh, so. I, we don't have much control I mean I, I voted against this three times in commissioner's court so you know. it doesn't, it doesn't help <laughs> yeah it doesn't help congestion no, no it, it really no, does it just uh, it circulation maybe shortcut to I-10 for some folks but no it doesn't I, help. Well, in fact, I, Lemon I, Creek is coming off of Old Fredericksburg. Well, Lemon on Creek's east. on the the other side of the at the county line. But I would, I would comment that this area is in the San Antonio ETJ. Yeah, area. exactly. The city, I have no you control. The city of Bernie has no control okay. of this area. Let it go. We pass. Next okay, year. we're going <laughs> to eliminate this from future consideration. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is a. Um, um, there's the proposal here is it's starting somewhere in the vicinity of Ammon Road and Highway 46 that there be an elevated roadway that parallels or on top of Highway 46 over to Esser and that it then the elevated roadway continue on above the hike and bike trail, old number nine old hike number and bike nine. trail up to 1376. Can we just say no? No. <laughs> I'd very, say no. Yeah. That seems like a plausible and reasonable yep. thing to do. Any objections to saying no? No objections. No objections to no. Okay. No objections to saying no. Uh, <laughs> the next project is a greenfield, largely greenfield project. Uh, we initially, the subcommittee initially started to say don't include this and include it at first list of 20. But there is a little bit of a nuance to this one in that the suggestion here is that this Greenfield project run next to the high transmission power line right away. So there is some. And what problem are we solving for? We're trying to get from 46 to Sisterdale Road? I, I guess, I guess. I, I don't think that. Yeah, There's I don't no think that helps there. the mobility that we're looking for. Um, we don't have good tra uh, traffic counts, um, and I would say that the transmission lines have already bisected proper uh, properties, and I, 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 I would hate to see roads I'm continue a, yeah. to bisect them. It's creative, and I give the person you know a lot of kudos for thinking of this, but I just don't see the feasibility of it or the desirability, frankly. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just my two cents. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Pull it. Any objections to eliminating it from future consideration? 
Let's eliminate it. Rice, are you object? Is that a no, objection? Eliminate. Take it out. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's gone. Sorry, that wasn't clear. <laughs> that, that's city council speaking. I'm county commissioner. So <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's dive on into the next seven. That's not fair. <laughs> Um, uh, um, okay, I need to say something here. <laughs> this is where we're talking about about how, discussion of projects that extend through the southeast quadrant, the area that most of our public comments came from today. And, you know, um, uh, some of y'all know, Bitsy mentioned an article I had written describing the conundrum that faces the committee here. We've got a traffic problem that we could solve, except that solving the traffic problem uh, threatens water and environmental resources. It involves private property rights. And so how do we, how do we resolve this? And I guess, it, you know, it, it, these, it, it's on the city's major thoroughfare plan. I believe, isn't it, Jeff? Some of these, not this exactly. Not one. this, but there uh, are. There's others. Th there are there. roadways through there. But and again, our our thoroughfare plan really is only used when people sell to developers. Yeah. Um, so that's the point of our thoroughfare plan is so when mm -hmm. it might not be you, it might not be, it might be your grandkids, but someone's going to sell to a developer one day, maybe, and we want to be able to have a plan in place for when that happens. And and. Don, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, I feel like you're being interrupted again by the audience. I'm having a hard time not having my attention divided because of constant other conversations. Um, so if people wouldn't mind, I think Don was really trying to address an uh, important issue, and, and there was multiple conversations happening. Um, there's a foyer and lots of other spaces out there to have other conversations. Thank you, Jonah. Um, I think we may want to consider, rather than addressing these on a project basis, that we address it in a narrative way and lay this out for for the city and the county to say, you know, you, you have some choices here, and really none of them are good. You're going to live with continuing traffic problems? Are you going to do something that uh, that may... <clears throat> Is, is not well received in the community. Right. And there's a number of ways to address that, and there's a lot of choices there. What do you, I mean, it's, it's really, how do y'all want to do this? Um, well, we, I've said, oh, good. Mr. Well, we have to deal with it as a project, I suppose, because it's been submitted as a project, but I, we're, we're, we're drifting into a policy recommendation mm -hmm. mode rather than, mm -hmm project because we're starting to back up to you know 30,000 foot view of this um, so in everybody's perfect world we're going to stop development down there we're just going to stop yeah. it and we're going to make traffic go somewhere else and that may be some version of a policy recommendation coming out of here and we and we don't put any specific project recommendations to address it I don't know all I'm all I'm sensing <clears throat> from our two and a half years of work and the reaction from the public and Don's incredibly insightful view of this conundrum is it is a conundrum. And how do we, we were not sent here to address water quality uh, and a host of other growth management issues that our county doesn't even have the ability to act on if we did. So there are limits. We can, we can offer opinions coming from this committee and recommendations. We certainly can't instruct them. And I, if we get into specific, every time I look at a map that's got a line on it, it's, it, it, it offends what we said we were going to do because we're not going to do that until we've talked to property owners. And Don, I think we all realize there's no way in that quadrant to get this done where people are out here applauding us for drawing a line on a map through the southeast quadrant. That is not, apparently not going to happen under any circumstance. So you guys need to figure out, you're the voters, not me and Don, how do you, 
how do you want to do it? I'm just I'm just observing that it may be morphing more toward policy than it is project. I can't imagine a project that would get a consensus out of this committee to even become a recommendation. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, I think you're right. I mean, I, I'm going on record as saying I think we need an additional connection from 46 to 10, which is what I think these proposed projects are designed to do. But I just don't see a viable path through the southeast quadrant. Too much going on. Too many environmental issues. Too many cars features. Too many caves. Too many caverns. Just too much stuff environmentally. Plus, you've got to cross the Cibolo. I just don't, I think it's a whole can of worms. You likely wouldn't get it through the EPA anyway. So that's just my thought. So um, I have a couple thoughts on this as well. I think we had a really, I thought, very um, valuable discussion at the last meeting re related to eminent domain. Um, and I made a comment a few meetings ago that uh, people got a little bit upset about, about if, um, and I think there's probably a better way to phrase it, which is this, which is if um, if we as a committee decide we want to protect that area and we're not going to touch it in 10 years from now, that's all subdivisions in there. And there's just a little bridge that could have been built and there'd be a connector and it's not there, then that would be really disappointing because it could have solved a lot of traffic problems. What, when that property is being developed. I am not a fan of eminent domain, and I think a lot of the concern of people in this audience, a lot of people wouldn't be here if that wasn't a threat. Mm -hmm. um, and in my opinion, if we, I, I think, you know, we've, we've had many multiple at length meetings with George Vinnie, and he's, he's pretty clear that, um, that this is doable uh, from a geological port perspective. People are building houses on top of that stuff, and it's, tragic it's, it's disappointing but if we do nothing that does not mean nothing is done it could be wall-to-wall -wall houses and roads and yards and pesticides put in yards and all kinds of stuff even if we do nothing and so to me um i if there was a if there was an assurance that the road would be built if a developer is building is going to develop this property all we do is say, hey, you're a developer, you're building this property, make sure that you align a road here so it connects to where this one would be without putting new people's properties at risk. That would be the way, I think, to, um, to do that through the thoroughfare plan. The, the thing that, that gets me to want to vote no to all of these is the potential risk that somebody is going to see this and say, yeah, we need to do this with eminent domain. And... Um, and, and going to leave, lead to a whole lot of heartbreak of a lot of families that have contributed generations uh, uh, to the, you know, beautiful town that we have now. So, I, I, I agree with you. I've thought a lot about um, this in the last few days. And I think where I've come down with regard to the major thoroughfare plan is it seems like some of the major thoroughfare plan we have now has routes that go through already developed properties. Is that... Fair, Jeff? I mean, Already developed properties. That's part example. of the thoroughfare? Yeah. It, ranches at Creekside. Yeah, correct. Has a, correct. Okay. So ranches at Creekside, that's how we're getting Copper Creek okay. Road. But, but, if you, but the actual existing thoroughfare plan, doesn't it come, I mean, it, it comes on Ms. Ms. Gerhardt and Ms. Uh, Ms. Um, McCarthy. McCarthy's McCarthy. down, down their driveways. Which that's I, I consider that an already developed area. It may not be densely developed, but it is their property. So we we're going through already developed property. There are portions of it, yes. Right. Okay. And so I think one way for us to couch our recommendation is to say the major thoroughfare plan should carefully avoid already developed properties because it truly is a tool not to not to traverse developed properties or subdivisions, but to traverse land that might be developed. Agree, 100%. And, and so if we, I think that kind of couches that, it, it really takes the eminent domain out of play. Well, the major, thir the major thoroughfare plan is going to do it anyway, right? I mean, as these parcels get developed, that's so, when these roads are supposed to go in. Correct. Correct. We're not, and so, we're not using eminent domain at all in terms correct. of the major thoroughfare. But, but what it does, though, if you if you draw it on their driveways, 
and you know, say, I mean, Mr. Pfeiffer is south of them. If you draw a major thoroughfare through there and say, well, you're never going to develop your property. It's not going to, if, if you ever do, then you put the road here and it connects to their driveway. They don't ever want to develop their property. So what do you do? There won't be any connection. There won't be a connection. It just stops. Somebody's going to come along and say, we're going to condemn those two driveways. <laughs> well, we can make a recommendation not to do that. But, of course, you know, long after Bryce is gone and others elected, you're, mm -hmm. you're leaving. Uh, future council, future commissioner's court can choose to do what they want, mm -hmm. despite what this, rec this body might recommend. That's true. That'd be unfortunate, but that can happen. But, but what we're doing mm -hmm. is not, not saying this roadway has to go along here. We're saying the example we're using A to B is a very good example. We're, we're, we're saying that from a 30,000 foot level, we think a roadway needs to be done in this general area. Similar to, I mean, in the trail subcommittee, as trail enthusiasts or folks that have been design, designed and laid out trails before, this is a good alignment for a trail this makes sense even if we put a line on a map saying this is where the trail should be it's not going to be that exact spot but we've been commissioned with saying these projects will improve transportation will improve circulation improve uh, 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 congestion we need to at least present that priority that recommendation so that when when development does come further on down just like a sewer line if, if a city's planning out sewer they're going to say well it, eventually when we go into this area we're going to have so many connections they they don't know it's an assumption it's a high level assumption of we're going to extend sewer i mean do we are are is this area always going to have septic tanks is everybody going to be on septic tanks forever i don't know we got to plan something. That's what we're doing in this committee. We're we're saying let's lay this out and tell them what we think the priorities are. I, and and I, that came to mind because nineteen that looks like a good trail alignment, something to that extent. And we've talked about that, but without supporting or committing to something or opining on something. What does the city or the county have to get it done once development does come into action? I, I this, this I've been I've worked with cities that have that have had to go through eminent domain, and it's very rare. I mean, the, the example that I forgot I think I don't know who used the example of electric companies or the gas companies using eminent domain. That's completely different. Council members will not go through eminent domain. I mean, they, you wait for development. And to for Jeff or for the county, next county judge, to have a plan and something to tell the developer, this is what I need from you, we need to tell them something. And that's, I would comment kind of even, so I, I inherited the thoroughfare plan we have today. I've only been at the city for a couple of years. But even to, to tie into what Jonah said, there are multiple tracks that when I got here two years ago, these tracks are never going to be developed. And I know for a fact today, developers own those tracks and developers are working on plans for those tracks. So to tie into Jonah, if we're not planning for, we're just going to create more holes that we're not planning for developers one day happening. So and it might not ever happen, what's, but we need to plan for it in case it does. What's the alternative? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we offer solutions like Vana spoke about the nature preserve? That place is unbelievable. And I, I believe that the property that's out on Cascade Caverns is probably phenomenal too. He said it was beautiful. What's the alternative? How do we offer solutions for that so people can remain on their property and it be undeveloped yeah. and they still benefit from being on that property? Can we say anything to that effect? I would like to support that in the sense that this is one of the most precious parts of our community. It runs along the Cibolo Corridor. It provides, an, uh, uh, it provides for our aquifer. I don't know why we can't ask for a preserve status for this 
area as a whole. I think we're we're treading in some seriously d desperate. S you put a, a line on there. Somebody's going to try and cross that line mm. and develop it. If you don't, you might risk having a development come online with a density that can't this area can't tolerate. But those are no good choices. Well, I, I think something along the line of a protected status, because that is our water. I don't, I don't like the idea of just putting it on the map in case development comes. I'd rather say, this is too precious to even draw a line through. And, and call attention to the fact that, you know, the EPA, text, or TCEQ, um, would they even support a development with density, regardless of their... Unfortunately, the yeah, answer we'll, is yes. Yeah, so that yeah. area, yeah. if the landowner sold it tomorrow, yeah. it would be KB Homes from yeah. one side to the next. And that's the reality of the difficult situation mm -hmm. that we're in. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think listening to all this, what, what keeps hitting home to me is the problem is fundamentally rooted in trust that the thoroughfare plan is going to honestly be yeah. what it is going to be. Yeah, yeah. And if we can, I, I think that a policy statement or something to that effect, that, that violating the trust of the thoroughfare plan would probably have irreparable harm to the, for the rest of the community and the belief that we will develop a, a connectivity in a way that is responsible and does not infringe upon the, the property rights of those who have, you know, live in this town. Mm -hmm. But I do think I do think a thoroughfare plan the planning process makes a lot of sense. If if Bitsy, if there was any way to to say to designate on a map and say we this is a low density development only, are we not going to do that? If if there was some authority the county had or some way to designate that area, I would be behind totally behind that. But right now I don't I don't know of anything. The hand, we're all, the county has its hands tied by Austin mm -hmm. and by the lack of the ability of having local authority to control our own, you know, development. And that's just, you know, that's getting political. But that's sort of the that's reality. reality that we're in. It is the reality. It just seems like it's a, it's just well, very unfortunate. It's Jeff, what is the status of the city's major thoroughfare update? So that's part of this work that Kimley Horn is working on now. Okay. Um, so we're hoping um, into the summer and the fall we'll have an update to the thoroughfare plan. I know that there are state laws and rules that govern how thoroughfare plans are implemented and drafted and all of those things. And its authority is couched in state law. But I think that our, going back to this, I think a policy recommendation about how to deal with this area that incorporates comments about the thoroughfare plan, comments about the desire to protect the area, either whether you do nothing or whether you have to do something ultimately, is the best way to deal with the southeast quadrant rather than, than to go a project recommendation approach. May I ask, Jeff, um, what is the flood plain expansion in that area. Uh, the new maps have been released. And I noticed in one of the maps that I have, uh, I think Lance gave it to us, it has some floodplain indication uh, that goes right through this area, which made me think, you know, how much of that area now is in a floodplain? So the San Antonio River Authority is in process of doing an updated DFIRM digital flood insurance rate map. Um, so they're, they're in process right now, and they've studied for Bernie, basically all of Bernie is in the limits of the study of the San Antonio River Authority. Mm -hmm. That doesn't go all the way out into the county. Um, that study has been done. I've been to meetings where I've seen the maps, but they haven't actually issued them for public knowledge yet. They will, they've sent them to FEMA to go through the first round, and the River Authority is expecting in the summertime to start having public meetings for the new floodplain maps, and it'll be like a 18 month, 24 month process before the new maps go into effect. Um, these new maps are using a new hydrologic method to figure out how much rainfall it is. And also with the Atlas 14 higher rainfall volumes based on the new data. 
Um, from the maps that I've seen, most of our city, and again, I've paid attention to the city areas, and this is all out, a lot of this is outside the city. Um, in the city area, most of our floodplains are staying very much the same, or they're raising six to nine inches higher. Um, and that's why our, our floodplain code that we updated um, recently went to, a, instead of a one foot above the base flood, we went to a two foot above the base flood because we know the floodplains are going up. Now there are a couple creeks that we've seen. Um, one is Browns and one is Curry Creek that the depth seems to be going up even more than that um, in the city. Um, but until the River Authority issues these maps to me and to the public to review, um, all I can go is from the meetings that I've seen. So how significant is this area relative to potential flooding, considering the Swalettes and the caves and all of the karst formations there? So it's in the floodplain world, there's not a floodplain model that accounts for holes in the ground where water disappears. Um, so in actuality, a lot of our floodplain lines in this area, the lines are worse because they don't take into account losses to that. these losses and it's actually something that they've been working on that there's flood gauges and there's one on the on the preserved property um, there's a flood gauge that tracks how much and how deep the water is and what the modelers do is they take a rainfall event and they say and they calibrate it to those gauges and they've actually had a very tough time in this stretch of the Cibolo because their computer models aren't spitting out the numbers that match with the gauge and it's taken them months and months to calibrate the model and to try to figure out some of these losses where water's just disappearing so in general most of our maps are conservative on that side of town if that makes sense we are up against a <coughs> hard break as they say uh tim and jonah and i think uh vincy y'all been working on some narratives policy stuff we have with uh, ben and jeff yeah, and seth mitchell okay and we're going to convene as a subcommittee right after this meeting okay do you believe that um you will be prepared to make a presentation to us at the next meeting we if we say we're going to address these as policy rather than project we've really gone through all the crowdsource stuff and I think we could spend a lot of time on that next time if you think y'all will be ready. I think we'll be ready, but it won't be me because it's spring break week. Uh, two weeks from Aren't today. Aren't you a little so, older than me? Well, I do, but I've got a 15-year-old who oh, likes okay. to do that. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> so I won't be here at the next meeting. I won't be here as well. There yeah. may be a problem for a few of us. I don't know. And, who have yeah, kids in school. Have, that I won't be here the 15th. Yeah. Yeah, I won't be here. I believe there are actually two that we needed to discuss. There's only one that we discussed as a committee for committee. Okay. Okay. Well, we will cover those next time around, and then I think maybe we'll start looking at. Well, I think we better poll the committee and see who can't be here. We may, we may have to dispense with the next meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you all for your hard work today. We're making progress. We will go back to Mrs. Rudd. Thank you. Um, more photos just that I've taken of the general area. And I totally agree with the other commenter, and I appreciate her comment. This is a road that you really will not appreciate on the map or even my pictures. You have to drive it, at, and especially at night, and experience the fear <laughs> that I experienced for six months, even being afraid to go out the door at night, afraid to drive down the road. Um, these are all different shots. These are not the same blind cor corners. There's just a bunch of them. In one direction, at least 10 that are signed, and probably five or six more that don't have signs. I'm going to change the board for a second. Okay. Is this on Kreitzberg again? Yes, this is Kreitzberg Road. And this is just one, uh, pretty much one direction. There are some areas where I've caught a couple of snapshots, but just double it, basically. Um, that's what you're looking at. A lot of yellow signs, blind curves, very dangerous. And um, also notice uh, multiple points of damage. This is areas where it floods, and there's ruts in the road. Um, the road does flood significantly in heavy rains. A lot of elevation changes. That also brings another issue, ice. 
even when we don't have a major ice storm, you have patches of black ice at some of the higher elevations. During the ice storm in February, um, it was so bad I couldn't make it up the hill near Cordillera. I had an emergency errand, and I almost couldn't make it home. And, but even in normal ice conditions in a regular winter day, those curves can be extremely dangerous. The only reason we haven't had more death and injury on that road is because there's low traffic. That has been the saving grace. It's a residential area. I know it says county road, but it really is. It's barely bigger than the roads in River Mountain Ranch. And being a dead end has saved us. I've been up out there at night. I've had people behind me flashing their lights. They're impatient because I want to drive safely. They want to pass. There's nowhere for me to go. There's no shoulder. It's dark. They pass me illegally going 60 miles an hour. There's, we're lucky that not three cars are smashed. That's how bad it is. I want to show real quick a shot of 474. Okay. Kreutzberg em empties onto 474. And right here, actually also there's another point on the environment. Here you will see there are blind curves on both sides um, of the intersection. There's a blind curve headed towards the river and there's a blind curve, he blind curve headed back towards town. So you have that on top of the dangerous road. If we start having more cars trying to get on 474, you're going to have a very, very dangerous intersection. Again, the saving grace, there's not a lot of cars. They have traffic during school time. Today, when I headed to the meeting, very few vehicles. At night, you can literally camp out where I live. Once you pass Cordillera, there's practically no traffic. I don't know who wants this route who's going to 3351, I'm sure some people will benefit, but the risks are huge, and I think we're going to be causing a lot of problems. Last note, um, remembering the photos of the canyon that I showed you, those canyons are beautiful. There are caves in the area. Cave without a name is on Kreutzberg. I have a small cave on my property. I'm almost afraid to look and find out my house is on top of one. <laughs> But this is a beautiful, pristine, untouched area. I know that's probably not the highest priority. I've seen mountain lions across the river hanging out. Uh, I saw one twice. I think it was the same lion. So this is not a project that I would deem desirable. I would love next week to see it off the table, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rudd. Thank you. Any closing comments? I just want to thank Ms. Rudd and Mr. Delnick and others who've spoken. They've spent a lot of time, and in Ms. Rudd's case, she spent some money for those fancy mm -hmm. photographs. Um, so thank you for doing that and for your, doing your due diligence. Only the thought is uh, keep uh, our friend and co-member co John Kite in your prayers and thoughts because he goes back in for another surgery Thursday. So we yes. want to be sure that uh, uh, things turn out well and that uh, we're supporting our, our friend. With a reminder to go vote. Come, come down to the microphone, please. I'll be all best. I wanted to respond to Jonah talking about in 10 years you'd be really upset this development happened. At least a major portion of this connection that borders all of us, the only way that that would be developed in 10 years is if you put a road through it. Because most of us have flag lots. And you actually cannot, unless you were to build a house for your child or something, we're deadlocked. So that scenario could not happen for us. Only if you put a road and you create frontal footage, then developers are going to come in and say, oh, this is perfect. So we're trying to protect what we have. But if you put a road through, you open it up. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. I just wanted to remind everyone in the community about this meeting coming up next week with TxDOT and the Rural mm -hmm. uh, Transportation Improvement Program. They, the Kendall County links are live on their website and you can see the proposed upcoming projects from TxDOT. Most of it is resurfacing, but the, the meeting is next Tuesday in comfort. Thank you. And Jeff, the mobility, open house, would you remind folks about that? Maybe you Correct. Didn't yeah, I mentioned it at the beginning of okay, the meeting. Okay, I wasn't yes, here. Sorry about that. 
Thursday from three to seven at Kronkowski Place is the most city's mobility open house meeting, and you can come and go as little or long as you like. Thank you. Let's Kyle will give you the last word if it's short. <laughs> Lance Kyle, 226 Cascade Caverns Road. Um, I just want to add to what Vialisa was saying. Um, a lot of that property along Ammon Road on the western side of Ammon, it's, you know, we're talking about 10, 20, 30 acre flag lots. It's very fragmented. It's very difficult to assemble. These developers want these 100 acre tracks. I, I don't know. They want 60, 100 acre tracks, uh, it seems like. That seems to be the model that they're using. As for uh, Old Fredericksburg Road and Cascade Caverns Road, unfortunately, um, South Glen got put in on the edge of our uh, watershed there. Um, uh, Lily Ranch is our only major exposure right now. We have, uh, thanks to the county commissioners, uh, we've deferred that uh, for at least two years, two and a half years. We've kept that from happening. Um, I will definitely be litigating if they keep pushing it. So we, hopefully we can kill this thing off and uh, do something with that property uh, that's, uh, you know, not, not as intensive in terms of density, something that, uh, you know, fits the, um, the environmental sensitivities a lot better. Uh, but hopefully we can kill off that uh, Lily Ranch exposure and not let this neighborhood go to wreck and ruin like so many others in the area. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we're adjourned. <laughs>